Hello and welcome to Capital Ideas TV. I'm Mark Bunting. There are very few industries growing as fast as the cannabis sector, making it one of the hottest investment opportunities out there. More and more jurisdictions are decriminalizing or even legalizing cannabis, and consumers have more access to it than ever. But this is creating an age-old imbalance between supply and demand. You just have to take a look at this chart by Canaccord Genuity. Roughly 200,000 kilograms of recreational cannabis are expected to be consumed in Canada next year. Analysts predict the country's 30-odd licensed producers will not be able to handle that much demand all at once. Producers are currently scrambling to expand their output, but they may be playing catch-up for a while. Recreational consumption is forecast to swell to 425,000 kilograms by 2021. By then, about 3.7 million Canadians, a tenth of the population, are expected to be users. If there's one stock exchange that embodies all of this enthusiasm for cannabis, it's the Canadian Securities Exchange. Its 51 cannabis-related stocks make up one of every seven listed on the CSE and about 45 to 50 percent of the total trading volume. The CEO, Richard Carlton, explains why cannabis stocks are so important to the CSE. Richard, in, in 2014, the CSC decided to come up with a, a strategy as it related to the, the cannabis sector. And you were quite early compared to the other exchanges in, in, and you were different in your approach. So tell us what you did. We had a number of companies approach us, uh, Mark, uh, that were applying for licenses uh, under the MMPR regime in Canada. So this was the process where Health Canada was uh, licensing uh, authorized producers uh, for the medical uh, business in Canada. And uh, uh, what we were hearing is that uh, uh, other exchanges in Canada were not considering these companies uh, appropriate to list uh, because they were still applicants. They hadn't in fact received the license. Uh, for us that seemed uh, uh, a little curious. Uh, these were companies that were looking to build out their uh, grow facilities. And these are, of course, uh, very capital-intensive, uh, large-scale facilities. And, uh, you know, it was a real challenge for these companies to raise the money. So from our perspective, we did see these uh, companies as uh, engaged in an active business, which is what's required to be a public company on the Canadian Securities Exchange. And so we did, in fact, uh, approve a number of these companies uh, for uh, listing on the exchange in the spring of 2014. So you went to them, they came to you, and uh, this whole... Uh, situation developed to the point where now you have, is it 51 cannabis related companies no, on, your, think, on your exchange? I think, I think that's right. Yes. Okay, and they make up a, a big chunk of the, the volume, about 45 to 50 percent? That's right. Uh, I mean, clearly the uh, sector has been of great interest uh, to the uh, trading community in, uh, in Canada and internationally over the last, uh, last little while. And uh, they are amongst our uh, uh, trade volume leaders on a, on a daily basis. And have you found, Richard, over the past three years that the cannabis sector and your listings and the types of companies, it's sort of come in waves, I mean, three distinct phases? That's correct. So after we had the uh, applicants for the uh, medical marijuana uh, licenses, we saw the uh, ancillary uh, companies, uh, people who are developing different uh, delivery systems, uh, whether it's uh, vapes and topicals and patches and so on. Um, we also have uh, a company that is working with law enforcement uh, authorities in North America on a, on a roadside uh, breathalyzer test for THC con concentration in the, in the bloodstream. Um, a number of companies, again, with a different take, but again, the common denominator being uh, an involvement in the cannabis uh, industry. Uh, the last wave uh, was really companies that were looking to take advantage of opportunities uh, in the United States. And as we know, uh, a number of uh, jurisdictions in the U.S. have uh, approved uh, cannabis not just for medical but also for full recreational use. And uh, so companies, uh, again, faced significant challenges in raising the necessary capital to, you know, build a, a, a grow-up or build a retail organization or to build out uh, an edibles manufacturing or an extraction capability. Um, as difficult as it may have been in Canada, it was even more difficult in the United States uh, for a variety of reasons for these companies to, to raise capital. So again, we saw companies uh, approaching us um, to uh, list on the Canadian Securities Exchange, raise money from Canadian investors in order to, uh, to, to grow the companies uh, in, the, in the jurisdictions that we're operating in. Like a Friday Night Inc., for example, which is uh, on the show that you're appearing as well uh, today. So uh, the TSX has introduced a lot of uncertainty in the cannabis sector. 
based on what you're talking about here, uh, if they have U.S. operations. So where does the CSE stand on that? Well, we were recently, uh, I guess, bolstered in the uh, stand that we've taken with respect to companies uh, with operations in the United States by the Canadian Securities Administrators. Uh, this is the umbrella group for the Securities Commissions across Canada. And they issued a guidance notice uh, to companies and their advisors uh, with operations in the United States on what was expected of them by way of uh, disclosure uh, to the marketplace uh, as they were listing and uh, ongoing. And we have, uh, um, you know, exactly the same sort of view um, that it's all about disclosure. The company has to obviously uh, commit to us that they're going to operate in accordance uh, with uh, applicable laws and regulations. But it doesn't just stop there. They have to disclose how they're going to do that. What kind of internal compliance programs do they have to ensure ongoing compliance uh, with the rules in the jurisdiction that they're operating? While cannabis is increasing in popularity, there are still many health concerns to actually smoking it. Vaporizers may be the answer. These small electronic devices heat up the cannabis at high temperatures, and the only byproduct is water vapor. So this is seen as a lot healthier way to consuming pot, and vaporizers have become a hot item. Namaste Technologies is at the forefront of the vaporizer business. The company sells several different types of vaporizers that are multi-purpose, meaning they can burn cannabis in dry herb, concentrate, or liquid form. Namaste is now the largest online retailer of vaporizers and other smoking accessories with a reach across more than 26 countries. It's also striking deals with industry players to grow its brands. It recently reached an agreement with Aurora Cannabis to sell its vaporizers through the company's website. This large presence is reeling in plenty of customers. Namaste's web traffic has soared from about 50,000 monthly visits in July of 2016 to more than 600,000 just five months later. Traffic is holding around that high mark this year, and the company now counts 1 million customers in its database. Namaste is not content to just sell vaporizers. It's in the process of acquiring a license to sell medicinal marijuana online in Canada, and it's eyeing other locales. CEO Sean Dullinger explains this second phase of the expansion. Sean, tell us about the growth that Namaste Technologies has seen in the past couple of years from a user base standpoint, geographically through some of your acquisitions, because it's been quite uh, robust. Yeah, so when we went uh, public uh, in uh, February of 2016, we were just doing about $2 million in revenue. And uh, this uh, past month, we did uh, pretty close to $1.5 million uh, in revenue for uh, for a month, uh, a little over a year later. It's, uh, yeah, we're excited. We're getting 500,000 unique visitors every single month to our website, and that's globally. No one has that type of exposure out there. It's not just Canada. Uh, with our acquisition of Australian vaporizers back in March, it added uh, $3.5 million to our top line, and uh, we're super excited about the growth. So back in the day, you were selling how many vaporizers a day, and how many are you selling now? When I started out of my garage three <laughs> years ago, we were selling uh, three or four units a day. Um, and believe it or not, when we started, that's all we thought we were going to sell. And that quickly became uh, 50, 60, 100. And today we're now sending out over 1,000 units every single day globally. That's got to be gratifying for you. So the, the next stage, or one of the next stages for you, is CanMart. You're essentially looking for a, a license to uh, sell medical marijuana. Where does that stand right now? So we are roughly two months away from getting that license. and. Um, the great part about the Canmart license is that we've proven to the world what we could do just selling peripherals. And if you think about it, if PAC sells a unit with a 10-year warranty, how many customers are coming back to repurchase a unit? So we keep getting new customers and creating this amazing database. And customers who are coming to our website, obviously they're cannabis users because that's what our units work fantastic for. With CanMart, it's going to allow us to create a whole marketplace on our website for different strains of cannabis, not only domestically in Canada, but we'll also be able to import marijuana from different countries such as Israel or Colombia. And how neat will that be when there's a variety of different products in a marketplace? And this is part of the reason you, you've partnered with uh, Afria, Canopy Growth, Aurora. And, and would you say that, that if, if 
companies like that, they want to broaden their reach, they, they need to probably go through you guys. Absolutely, and then also with the smart technology that exists in vaporizers, uh, we've been contacted by a few companies that now have these pod-like solutions. With our license at Canmart, we'll actually be able to fill these pods with different types of cannabis in it, uh, different strains and different brands, and then be able to ship out the whole solution. So we're known as a global leader for vaporizers, but we think that we could also take market share in uh, selling cannabis. And Sean, how would you describe Namaste Technologies culture and why do customers go to you as opposed to, say, an Amazon? By offering amazing customer service and putting that as our number one goal, if you look at Trustpilot, it's a third-party independent uh, site that reviews uh, trust. Namaste, which we could, you could go and put any stars you want. We have the highest rating vaporizer company in the world, in the whole space, marijuana, et cetera. As well, we're in the top 0.3% of all e-commerce that exists. So we have 1,500 plus reviews uh, from individuals saying that these guys are doing a fantastic job. Amazon, if you have trouble with a vaporizer and you try giving them a call or sending them an email, nobody's there to support you. They'll simply tell you, here's your RMA or return label, and go ahead and pop it in the mail we go above and beyond to do anything for our customers. You're also gathering a lot of customer data and uh, incorporating machine learning into mining that data and analyzing it. So uh, explain that for us. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, we hear that word a lot these days. People love throwing it out there. Uh, Namaste has developed it all in-house. We teamed up with a company out of Sweden and they had art artificial intelligence and machine learning um, developed, but not for e-commerce. We partnered with them and said, we're amazing at e-commerce, let us use your solution and let us adapt it to what we do. The first site that we ever attempted to use it on was Australian Vaporizers that we purchased back in uh, March of this year. They were a company that had been around for five years. They converted at 4%, meaning if 100 visitors came to their website, four people would purchase. After putting on our software, which only gets better over time, we immediately saw the 4% move up to over 6% in just a few months. We believe that's proof in itself that our machine learning and artificial intelligence actually does what we say it does. And lastly, I want to circle back to revenue. You got some facts about Namaste's revenue compared to some other companies or all of the companies in the sector. And uh, also, you think that Based on that alone, uh, your stock is, is wildly undervalued. Yeah, every CEO will obviously yeah. tell you their stocks are undervalued. Uh, when This is my first time ever going public. I've had five dot-coms before, so the whole public markets has been new to me, mm -hmm. you know, and it's been a, an exciting ride. And uh, I'm sure I'm going to learn a ton more over the next, hopefully, many, many more years. Yeah. Uh, when we look, we went, we're now on a run rate of $24 million roughly in revenue. The only company doing more than us in the whole space is Canopy, and Aurora is very close to us. Namaste has a market cap of $38 million, and the two companies that I mentioned both have valuations of over a billion, with one of them being over two billion. Not saying we're as valuable as them, but with the data that we possess all around the world and being able to mimic the model that we're now developing in Canada through Canmart and being able to get these sales license in each country. In Australia, we have a database of over 300,000 customers that's been built up for over five years by the most trusted name Australian vaporizers in the space. You know, I'll, I'll let you decide, but $40 million versus a billion is uh, a big gap. If there's one thing the internet revolution has taught us, it's that knowledge truly is power. The more information you have about your customers, the better you can serve them. Cannibal Medical has made data gathering a key part of their business model, and it's paying dividends. Cannibal operates 19 medicinal cannabis clinics across Canada. Its physicians specialize in prescribing medicinal cannabis to patients and educating them on how to use it to treat their symptoms. Cannibal earns fees from patient visits, which are billed to the provincial government. More than 20,000 patients have walked through the company's doors since inception, and that's where the power of data comes in. 
Cannabo collects hundreds of data points from each patient treated at its clinics and uses it to determine which treatments are most effective for various types of patients and conditions. It then sells that anonymized information to cannabis producers and insurance firms eager for insight into their clients. Cannabo also conducts clinical studies and markets its findings to industry players. Clinical data is what will ultimately legitimize the medicinal cannabis business and open up countless opportunities in the market. Cannabo Medical's executive chairman, Dr. Neil Smith, explains what data means to the company's bottom line. So Dr. Smith, we talked about six months ago, and at the time you said one of the key revenue drivers for Cannabo Medical was the data that you were assembling from your uh, research. So update us on that and, and tell us why it's so important uh, sure. for your company. Sure, so um, as we anticipated, this quarter will be uh, cash flow positive. We're seeing more patients. We're up to now seeing about 1,400 patients uh, a month. And we anticipate over the next year, we'll see about 20,000 new patients. And as I indicated b before, a big portion of our uh, revenue moving forward is taking, monetizing the value of the information we receive from those patients. So we ask our patients, can we use the information that we've gathered from you? And we look at as many as 200 different data points when patients come in and we accumulate that data. Most of our patients are very keen on giving us that data because they, they want to advance the medicine. And so we keep that data in a data bank, which has been growing and becoming more robust. And then we can look at that data bank and we have a PhD statistician who's constantly looking at our numbers looking at that data to see where there are obvious trends. And when we see those trends, we see potential for research in those areas. And more and more, we're being approached by everyone from pharmaceutical organizations to licensed producers to even uh, many health organizations nationwide that are coming to us saying, we want more information on how medical marijuana works or what types of strains may work, um, how they should be administered, and all that information we can uh, we we can, get, we can look at from our existing data bank and we can use that uh, existing data bank going forward to create new prospective or moving forward double blind clinical trials, which is really what the medical community is looking for. And take that out a few years. How do you monetize that? What does that look like? Yeah, so that area is certainly growing. We just signed a, uh, a deal uh, looking at, for instance, opioid reduction, and we just signed a, a deal, uh, a grant for $310,000 for a group that wanted to know um, what are the prospective improvements in people's pain management and what is the potential to reduce opioid uh, use because of the concerns about opioid addiction. And so we can do the research and provide that information to that organization. And more and more, uh, as the medical community starts to become more accepting of the value of medical marijuana, they're going to want more of this research uh, before they are entirely accepting of it as a, uh, as a real medical modality. So that area is growing, it's growing fast, and we have several other research projects currently in the pipeline, and we're being approached uh, on a weekly basis um, from other organizations that are looking for our data or want to work with us to advance the medicine of medical marijuana. You touched on it there briefly. The last time we talked, you said the medical community to a degree, it was a bit cantankerous, a bit resistant. Sure. So here we are six months later. How are you finding the, the acceptance uh, so far? Yeah, I think broadly there's still a lack of acceptance, and that's understandable. Uh, physicians, especially new physicians coming out, are looking for what is known as evidence-based medicine. They want to see that whatever they're giving their patient is going to benefit them, and there are predictable outcomes, and that any potential side effects are minimized. And and to to really be able to do that, and, and as the medical community says, do no harm, we want to make sure sure that what we're giving the patient is going to have the outcome that we want. And the way to know that is to do these prospective double-blind placebo-controlled trials. And we're working on a couple of them right now, and we anticipate that the number that we're working on is going to continually grow. In the interim, however, what we provide to the family doctor or maybe an anesthetist who's practicing pain is a group of physicians. We have over 100 physicians in 19 locations. Uh, we provide a resource for them to say, when they say, 
I don't know if this is going to be good for your ailment. I don't know how to prescribe it. I don't know how to dose it, how you should take it. And we're the referral source for many of those physicians. So they can send their patients to us with the understanding that we have physicians who have more experience in this than anyone else. And what we're doing is we're establishing uh, best treatment protocols based on the research that we have already established from the data that we have. And going forward, we anticipate with more research, um, which we plan to monetize um, through partnerships with various organi organizations, we think that the medical community will become more accepting of this, but they need the research and we think we're the people to do that research. Now, from a stock perspective, where we've seen cannabis stocks take off again in sort of a, a second wave in yeah. this process, yeah. cannabis is doing better, but it, it's lagging. So yeah. uh, you say that licensed producers, pharmaceuticals, other groups they know what you're doing, they're yeah. interested, but the market's maybe not picking up on it yet? Yeah, and I think a lot of investors are not sure how to value our company. Um, and because of that, we haven't seen the same excitement as you've seen among licensed producers. But what we've continued to do is stay true to our model, grow our clinics, provide the best medical care out there um, through our clinics. And we've always recognized that we can monetize that and, and become profitable. And this year we're anticipating somewhere in the vicinity of $5 million in profits. Um, we will see, as I said, uh, 20,000 new patients. And those patients on average spend about $1,800 a year on medical marijuana. So you're looking at about $36 million in potential sales to a licensed producer over the course of a year. And that's just the new ones, not including the follow-up that we do with existing patients, of which we have now over 40,000. So uh, we think that the market in general is going to look Look for other companies that can do well in this space that are perhaps not simply the licensed producers that have benefit for, benefited from the uh, enthusiasm, enthusiasm around this uh, segment. Uh, but, uh, but we're seeing that, we're starting to see that, and we'll continue to grow our company and grow our model, and we think that's the, that's the best way to attract new investments. But we're always, uh, we're aware that pharmaceutical industries are looking at us, licensed producers are looking at us, people who are heavily involved in research are looking at us. Medicine. And you know, we're, we're obviously talking to all those people as well. If you're willing to take some risk in the marketplace and you want some big returns, the cannabis sector is the place to be among a few others. Bruce Campbell knows that. He founded Stone Castle Investment Management and he has investments in the cannabis sector. Right now, he has three ideas for you. Bruce, there are a lot of marijuana companies out there but an investor needs to be selective and you're managing money for people, you want to preserve capital. So how do you uh, approach the sector in terms of uh, picking the stocks that you do in, in the cannabis sector? Yeah, so one of the important things right now is we talk about management. And uh, one of my friends who's an analyst in the sector said, you know, you have to, uh, have to pick the jockey, not the, or not the uh, horse right now. And right. that's certainly the case. You know, I think over time, this is going to really uh, play out that the stronger management teams are going to be able to lead their companies and, and take them in directions that, you know, maybe the weaker players don't. Speaking of management teams, we talked to the CEO of Village Farms yeah. uh, in here a, a few months ago, and the stock has done really well since then. In fact, it's doubled. I, I like to toot our horn when I can every now and then because yeah. uh, it sort of coincided with our interview. It seems like the market woke up to what they're doing. So uh, remind us uh, what they're doing in terms of um, allocating a bunch of capacity to, from produce to cannabis and, and, and what makes them unique. Yeah, so they're, you know, they really have their roots in growing and they know how to grow really well and they know how to grow a number of different crops. And so they've done this deal with, uh, with Emerald where they're going to convert one of their Delta greenhouses into growing cannabis. And so what I think that, you know, they really bring to the table is obviously they already have an existing facility that's been built, so they're not building something, but they also have really strong depth of experience in growing and they've grown a number of different things. Cannabis is probably going to be, you know, a little bit different for them, but they'll be able to grow it and do all the things that they've done in the past. And, and buy it at these levels? Yeah, certainly, uh, you know, I still think there's a lot of opportunity here because, you know, the market has woken up to it. But if you look at, you know, the size of the greenhouse, they're going to be splitting everything with, uh, with Emerald. But if you look at the size of the greenhouse, it's the same size as, as Afria's greenhouse when they roll out. And the market cap's nowhere near, you know, the, the size of Afria's. A couple of other names you have for us here. They seem more like sort of lifestyle cannabis brands. Doja Cannabis, this was started by 
the same person who started Saks Underwear, which was hugely successful. And I, I won't make a joke about owning one pair because I do just to check them out. They seem fine. But they're talking about hand, making handcrafted cannabis. It sounds sort of like a, a marketing ploy. What does that mean exactly? How is that different from what other cannabis producers are doing? Yeah, so there's a couple things that I like a lot about Doja. One is Trent Kitch, who's the, the founder of uh, Saks and also the, the CEO of uh, Doja. He's very entrepreneurial. So, you know, he's the guy that started this. He's also started a number of other businesses, but he's also very passionate about cannabis. And so he uh, he's talked about, you know, handcrafted, really craft grow marijuana. So, the, you know, I think the market's going to really differentiate itself over the years where you're going to have sort of the mass producers who are only worried about, you know, producing at the lowest cost. And you're going to have guys who produce really high quality marijuana for that connoisseur. It's similar to the wine market, how you have, you know, sort of low end wines and you have high end wines. And that's really where these guys are focusing right now. So you're talking about sort of a artisanal and hand batch, or what do you call them, a small batch pr production that, in that way? Yeah, so their, their, their existing facility right now is still fairly small. They're gonna be expanding. They've announced that they're gonna expand into a little bit bigger facility, but it's nowhere near the size of say, you know, Aurora's at a million square feet. Like, you know, they're talking sort of, you know, eight or 10,000 square feet. Now the other one is called uh, Friday Night Inc. And that clearly, uh, portray sort of a lifestyle, hey man, it's Friday, uh, let's party. They're based in Vegas and they seem to have a, a whole wide array of, of products that they're offering. Yeah, so they have, um, they have really two sides of their business. So they have, you know, sort of the traditional, you know, what you would think of as marijuana, which is the THC side where they're producing all types of different uh, edible products and infused products. But the other side of their business that's quite interesting is their infused side, which is CBD. And of course that doesn't have the hallucinogenic drug in it, the THC. And they've been seeing huge ramp ups in sales there. In the US, the CBD isn't regulated as the THC is. And so they're able to like, you know, build this out. And so they're into, you know, pet products and lip balms and, and lotions. And uh, that business seems to be doubling every month here right now. What about beverages? Uh, they haven't got into any beverages yet, but I suspect that you know on the THC side of Friday night, they'll probably start to get into that as well. They're they're really um, expert extractors and and building products, so you know, I think it's only a matter of time before they probably get into that beverage side is on a, either distribution or on a uh, on actual manufacturing. And just for those who don't know, so uh, something infused with CBD. You do get high or you do not get high? No, you don't get the hallucinogenic effects, but you get all the medical effects with, with the CBD. Okay, and lastly, Friday night, I was looking at their investor presentation. They claim or have uh, projections of 10xing their sales by 2019, increasing them by 10 times. Is that ambitious or can they do that? No, I think they can do that because they've started off with a small facility. They're now moving over into a, a, another facility that they're gonna grow for. And then they're building out a facility as well. The, with, their, um, with their product and with their systems, they obviously make the most amount of money if they grow the marijuana and also do the extracts. But if they can get supply of the marijuana, uh, either from the trim side or um, from the bud side, then they're able to produce extracts as well, which is very high margin for them. So it's a function of as the as the Nevada market continues to build out its supply, they'll be able to get more supply themselves, both from growing it, but also from other producers, and that allows them to really ramp up their sales. From the heart of the financial district in downtown Toronto, that's our show for this week. I'm Mark Bunting. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode. And for more great investment ideas through our weekly digest and morning note, subscribe to CapitalIdeasResearch.com. Thanks a lot for watching and thanks for investing like a pro. We'll see you next time.